Yeah, thanks. I'd just like to give a warm welcome to everyone on the third of this series of talks on the Noble Eightfold Path, jointly held by Freedom of Mind with our friends over at Damasuka. And as I mentioned in the last few talks, my name's Callan, and I'm one of the people helping out with Freedom of Mind, which is a nonprofit fully dedicated to the alleviation of mental suffering. And to that end, we'll be supporting teachers like Delson in continuing to share the meditation practice and do more talks like this. And uh, I'm really happy to announce that we recently received a very generous donation from a member of the community, which is going to help us take things to the next level. And we're currently in the process of getting our website up and running, where you'll be able to connect with us directly and learn more about everything that we're up to in the coming weeks and months. And lastly, if you feel moved to support the foundation or to help out in any way, you'll be able to connect with us directly through our website. But in the meantime, please feel free to visit the donations page on the Damasuka site where you can currently support Delson directly. And I'll just say that we really appreciate all of your support and we look forward to seeing you all at lots of events and much more to come. And with that, I'll hand it over to Delson. So uh, today we're gonna to be talking about three things, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And these three constitute the um, sila, as we call it. Sila is the foundation of the path. When we talk about the three aggregates, as opposed to the five aggregates that we commonly know, uh, the three aggregates, as it's mentioned in Majjhima Nikaya 43, uh, are sila, samadhi, and panya. So over the course of this series, we've discussed already right uh, view and right intention. Now, right view and right intention are part of panya, actually because with right view, we come to the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And with right intention, we come to the understanding of how to let go. With right speech, right action, and right livelihood, we are starting off with sila. By the way, with regards to uh, panya, there is also another aspect to it, which we'll discuss much later on. But it is basically something that is unlocked, let's say, when somebody becomes fully awakened. And that's known as samanyana, that is right insight or right knowledge. But traditionally speaking, when we talk about panya or wisdom, it, it includes right view and right intention. So sila literally means foundation. It literally means the bedrock of something. You know, when we talk about sila as the Pali word, it comes from the Sanskrit word shila or shil, which uh, if some of you take uh, shilaji, you'll know what I'm talking about, which means, you know, shilaji is the victory from the mountains. And really what this is referring to is a state of mind that is unshakable or at least it's pointing to it. Now, when we talk about sila, a lot of people think, okay, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever, sila, yeah, we get it. We have to keep the precepts, we have to refrain from lying and we have to make sure we have a good uh, wholesome career and so on and so forth. Now get me to the good stuff, which is the meditation and panya and so on. Not so fast. It is really, really vital to understand the benefits of sila and the importance of sila. So when we talk about sila, you know, it's something that distinguishes us from the rest of the other beings, especially animals. Let's, you know, take aside the cosmology. If those of you who know the cosmology of the Arupa Lokas, the Rupa Lokas, you know, the different Brahmas, the different Devas and celestial beings, the hell beings, you know, the hungry ghosts and so on. Let's just talk about what we see right here, right now, right? The majority of us, all of us uh, at some point have only seen just the animal realm, right? We, perhaps we have pets, we have cats, we have dogs, we have lizards, we have snakes, whatever the pet is, or goldfish, but we have an understanding of other beings around us in the form of animals. 
And so when we think about the distinguishing factor between animals and humans, it really is sila. Animals have the capacity to experience some level of empathy. Animals have the capacity to experience some level of compassion. They have the capacity to experience even negative, afflictive emotions, just the same way that humans do. But human beings have a certain um, factor, which is to say that they are able to retain information, arguably speaking, you know, in terms of whatever information they receive, they're able to retain it for longer. And they're able to create ideas and concepts around it. As far as we understand it, animals, most animals are incapable of this. There are some animals like dolphins and other animals that seem to be more humane or more human-like in terms of the way that they create societies and they communicate and so on. But even so, when we talk about human beings and animals, humans have the capacity to have self-restraint, self-control, control, to a much greater degree than animals can. And so this is why there's an emphasis on sila. It is the understanding that when we keep sila, we are behaving, so to speak, like humans. When we think about the world around us and we think about the people in this world, the humans in this world, and we see society around us, especially now in our modern day, we see that there is less and less emphasis on sila because it seems like it's uncool to be moral. It's uncool to be ethical. People seem to be more enamored by being, you know, the bad boy or the, the person who breaks the rules and so on and so forth. But all that do does is it actually chains you to samsara. So when we talk about sila, it's not from some kind of moral high ground. It's just to regain and retain our humanity. When we talk about sila, it is the understanding that we are able to under, we are able to see and understand the pain in other beings to a much greater degree than animals can. So the first part of sila is right speech. And here I'm going to be reading again from Majjhima Nikaya 117, just a snippet. It says here, and what bhikkhus is right speech that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, abstinence from false speech, abstinence from malicious speech, abstinence from harsh speech, abstinence from gossip. This is right speech that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. So I'm not sure why the so the translation that I'm using is by Bhikkhu Bodhi. So I'm not sure why he's translated these words in the way that he has, because when you look at the original Pali, somehow the translation doesn't match up. And we talk about harsh speech. Actually, what we're talking about from the original Pali is divisive speech. Uh, I should say, sorry, malicious speech. When we talk about malicious speech, it is speech that is divisive. It is speech that is slanderous. It is speech that uh, actually indulges in gossip. So the translation of gossip is something else, which I'll get to. So what does it mean when we talk about slander? What does it mean when we say gossip? Gossip is talking about another person that we know to be true or untrue, but primarily let's say it's untrue. And we talk about them behind their back. And how do you know if you are indulging in gossip? Well, if you are saying something about another person, a third person to another person, and if that person were in the same room with you, would you be saying the same thing? If not, then you know that likely it is gossip because gossip is basically the indulgence of uh, you know, backbiting. It is the indulgence of um, you know, creating division. I heard this about this person, and so they are like this. And you start to create doubts about that person in others' minds. This is gossip. 
when you talk about false speech, false speech is speaking something that is untrue, speaking something that you know to be untrue. So if you've gotten information that you don't know whether it is true or not, you can preface it by saying, I have heard this information in this way. I don't know if it's true or not, but this is what has been told to me. So false speech can be uh, something that creates doubt in yourself as well. And what that means is when you indulge in any kind of lies, even if it's a white lie, you start to create doubt in yourself. And you will see this over time that you, you say one lie and you'll have to say other lies in order to cover up that lie. And then you create a whole other story around that whole process. But if you spoke the truth from the beginning, then you're okay. Then you're confident in yourself. You have a natural level of self-confidence. False speech, it creates a sense of doubt, not only in yourself and not only in others, but in your abilities in terms of your practice. This is why when we talk about keeping the precepts, uh, oftentimes I will talk about the benefits of keeping the precepts and also how that can create um, certain kinds of hindrances in the mind if we don't keep the precepts. So in this case, when we indulge in any kind of false speech, it actually starts to strengthen the hindrance of doubt. Now, when you do indulge in false speech, you also start to create doubt in others about yourself because of the way you behave. You know, if you start to indulge in false speech, you'll notice that uh, people start to stay away from you. They don't believe in what you have to say. But when you keep to the truth, when you become honest and you speak truth, there's something else that happens in your mind. No, no, not only do you have confidence, not only do you have self-confidence, not only do you have uh, the lack of doubt or the eventual eradication of self-doubt in the practice, but it is understood, and it has been understood in ancient India, that when you keep to your word and when you start to speak the truth at all times, then eventually you have perfect speech. You have something known as vak siddhi. Vak means voice and siddhi is a certain kind of accomplishment. So it can create things that you want in your life. In other words, when you maintain the truth at all times, when you don't indulge in falsehoods, then over a certain period of time, as you continue to be honest, as you continue to be correct with your speech, whatever it is that you say actually manifests. Whatever it is that you say about yourself or for yourself or for others actually manifests. And you can actually test this for yourself. When you create an intention and you speak out something, over time you will see that it actually does happen. So long as you continue to remain honest and not indulge in false speech. So that's false speech, malicious speech, which is the divisive speech. When you talk about harsh speech, you know, when we talk about harsh speech, this is actually um, abusive speech. This is speech intended to, intended to hurt someone. It's speech that comes from the intention of harming another individual. And so, very closely tied to the precept of not engaging in activities that harm and kill other living beings. Because you can really harm people with your words. You can really hurt people with your words. And we've seen, we've experienced it ourselves. And we've seen it for ourselves that when we say something that's untoward, when we say something that's hurtful, we can have a certain immediate sense of regret. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. You know, because we know that it is hurtful. We know that it is harmful. And it creates a low morale in others, and it creates a low morale in yourself. So when you pay attention to the words you speak and the tone of voice that you use and how you say certain things, then you become more and more 
aware of the kinds of words, the quality of your speech. And so this is very important to understand in order to experience and send out loving kindness. Buddha has talked about loving kindness or metta, as it's understood in Pali, as being not only in terms of the meditation of sending it out to other beings, that is your intention, that is mental acts of loving kindness, but there are verbal acts of loving kindness and there are physical acts of loving kindness. What is a physical act of loving kindness? Maybe somebody is in grief. Maybe you just are there and you embrace them. You put your hand on their shoulder and let them know that you're there if they need anything. What is a verbal action of loving kindness? Having comforting words to them, you know, appreciating people. Hey, I really like what you said about this thing, or I really like how you presented it in this way, or I really like how whatever it is, this sense of appreciation for others actually rebounds towards you as well. So it has a double effect. When you appreciate others, not only do they feel good, but then that is reciprocated in you, not necessarily from them, but from a sense of this warmth in your heart, this sense of loving kindness. So this is the refraining from harsh speech. Then it talks about refraining or abstinence from gossip. Actually, I'm not sure why uh, Bikibodi used this particular word because the original word that is used, I'll just bring it up here. It's an interesting word. It is sampa, sampapalapa. It's like an onomatopoeia. And what that means is nonsensical speech. It really means refraining from speech that is unnecessary. You know, it's okay to have small talk. It's okay to talk about the weather. It's okay to talk about how was your day? How, how are things going on? And so on and so forth. But then if you keep indulging in speech about like, hey, have you heard about this person? Have you heard about what happened here? You know, this is as the Buddha would refer to as a talk of kings. And you see that a lot in our news. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. I have seen news from wherever I've traveled and it's all the same. It's like they all have the same kind of speech that they use, which is to say they will give you the news and then they'll give you opinions about the news. And then they'll talk to you about people's lives who don't have any effect on us. You know, they indulge in this celebrity or that celebrity or this scandal or whatever it is. How does it affect you? What does it matter? You know, so, you know, having small talk, there's nothing really wrong with it. But indulging in this kind of talk about this or that is unnecessary speech. So in that sense, yes, it could be gossip, but really it's more about restless speech. When you indulge in this kind of speech, it causes restlessness in the mind. It's difficult for the mind to remain in one place for a longer period of time. So refraining from these kinds of uh, speech is really vital to the practice. And this really incorporates all of right speech. Now, I've always used this acronym, uh, THINK, T-H-I-N-K. Think before you speak. You know, you've often heard that from others. Why don't you think before you speak? And so when we say THINK, it actually stands for something. The T in THINK stands for timeliness. Is it the right time to say what it is that you want to say? Or is it not the right time? Perhaps I should not say it right now. Maybe it's not the right uh, place or time to say what I need to say. Maybe I should wait for another time. So this is timeliness. H is for honesty. Is what I'm saying true? Do I know it to be true? Do I know if it is valid? If I don't, then I preface it with saying this is what I've heard. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But honest, honesty, dealing in honest speech. I is for intention. What is the intention behind what it is that you want to say? Are you intentionally being you know, facetious? Are you intentionally being mean-spirited? Or yet, are you intentionally being kind? Are you intentionally being supportive? What is the intention behind what it is that you want to say? N is for necessity. Right? Is it necessary? So this is closely related to timeliness. 
But necessity here refers to, is it appropriate to say what it is that you need to say? Is it actually necessary for the other person to hear it? Or is it just indulging in um, you know, useless banter, so to speak? Is it indulging in speech that's you know, related to restlessness, related to this, that, or the other? Does it really you know, move the conversation forward? Does it really provide anything of substance? This is necessity. So make sure that when you speak, there is a certain intention there and there is some reason behind what it is that you want to say. Sub something of substance. And finally, K is for kindness. Can you say what you want to say with kindness? Now, whenever I say this on retreats or in other events, oftentimes there'll be a question. Well, I have to deal with situations where people are not behaving in the right way. Like, for example, your kids or, you know, I need to reprimand people in the office or at the workplace or whatever it is. Sure, you can do it, but you don't have to be mean spirited. You don't have to be harsh with your words. You can still be kind. You can still be um, empathetic. You can still be supportive in the way that you speak. So this is the speech. This is the right speech that we talk about. And, you know, when you get on any kind of twin retreat, you'll be told about noble silence. Noble silence is probably the best speech, refraining from speaking at all. You'll find that if you take maybe one or two days out of the week where you make it a point not to say anything, or at the very least not say uh, things that are unnecessary, and only speak when it's vital, you'll notice that your mind actually moves a lot more because as you start to become quieter and quieter verbally, your mind has a tendency to want to say things. And there's a whole myriad of thoughts and ideas and concepts that come to mind. So noble silence also is two parts. There is the noble silence of not saying anything verbally. But then there's the noble silence that you experience when the mind quiets down. And this is uh, the kind of noble silence of the mind that leads to intuition. I've often said this, that the birthplace, the womb of intuition is the quiet mind. And so for those of you who are developing this practice and have gotten to that point, you will notice that as your mind starts to quieten down, certain kinds of insights flow. It's as if you receive downloads of information that you would never have experienced uh, just from reading. It's like all of the dots are connecting. And this happens when your mind is quiet. You have to give the opportunity for your mind to be quiet, to be in this noble silence. So make it a point to try to pay more attention to the quality of your words, to the quality of your speech. And as best as possible, engage in noble silence, not only of speech, but also of the mind. Now, it also says here in the sutta, it says, and what bhikkhus is right speech that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. In other words, what is that kind of speech that noble ones use? What is that kind of speech that a fully awakened being might use? And he says, the desisting from the four kinds of verbal misconduct. The abstaining, refraining, abstinence from in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, whose mind who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is the right speech that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So in other words, when you start to develop the path, when you start to get onto this path, you make it an intention to always try to use right speech. The great thing is when you are on retreat, you're always in noble silence, hopefully. And you're automatically utilizing right speech in that sense. So you're already developing that factor of the path. And so once you do this and you start to become 
more aware of this and you start to get onto the path as somebody who has entered the screen as a noble being, as a noble person, you will see that whenever there is an inclination to gossip, whenever there's an inclination to use false speech, whenever there's an inclination to use harsh speech, whenever there's an inclination to use unnecessary speech, that part of the mind that is rooted in right view, that is to say, the super mundane right view that you achieve after having entered the stream starts to become your compass. And it's like Jiminy Cricket is on your shoulder and say, hmm, should you be saying this? Do you, are you sure you want to indulge in this kind of speech? And so having this kind of compass, having developed the path, leads you from or leads you towards desisting from the four kinds of verbal con misconduct. And then when it comes to somebody who's fully awakened, their speech will always be appropriate for whatever is required for the situation. There has been sometimes these interesting questions that come from time to time. Uh, one question was, and there are variations of this question. One question is, and it's all hypothetical. You know, what would you do if you found yourself in Nazi Germany or at the time of the Nazis and you were protecting people the Nazis were looking for and you had to lie in order to protect them? What would you do? And a variant of this particular question is, what if it was an Arahat, right? So what would you do? Would you lie or would you tell the truth and allow the people to be caught by these people? So that's, you know, these hypotheticals are really unnecessary. They're just creating a lot more restlessness in the mind. First of all, you know, speaking in terms of the idea of whether an arahat would be in the situation or not, they're not going to be in that situation. There's no way they would be found in that kind of situation. And the reason is this. When you start to keep your precepts and when you start to perfect the keeping of the precepts, you will find yourself in less and less situations where you have to lie. And eventually, you don't have to find your in yourself in any situation where you have to lie. You will see this for yourself. Oftentimes, when people tell white lies, maybe they have to lie to their boss at work, or maybe they have to do this, or maybe they're trying to impress somebody and they tell a white lie. What happens? you will find that that person finds themselves in situations where they have to often tell lies. But if you become truthful and you start to think before you speak, eventually those karmic fruitions will start to cease and you will find yourself in situations and circumstances where you never have to indulge in that kind of speech. So I would just say for all of you in the community, there's no need to indulge in these kinds of hypotheticals, right? Just focus on your own mindset, okay? And just do the basics. If you do the fundamentals, if you do the foundation, everything else will take care of itself. Now we'll get into right action. And what bhikkhus is right action, the Buddha says. Right action, I say, is twofold, right? There is the mundane right action and the super mundane action. And so he says, and what bhikkhus is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, abstinence from killing living beings, abstinence from taking what is not given, abstinence from misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is right action that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisition. So this is the mundane right action. And you'll see this is part of the five precepts. The first precept that we take is we abstain from killing or harming living beings. The second is we abstain from taking what is not given. The third is we abstain from any kind of sensual or sexual misconduct. The fourth is we abstain from false speech. We already talked about false and harsh speech, but in this case, false speech. We already talked about that in right speech. 
Now, what are these three referring to? Right? Abstinence from killing living beings. What does it mean to kill a living being? Well, actually, in certain commentaries and in the Abhidhamma, it talks about what does it mean? There has to be a living being. There has to be an intention to kill. There has to be a weapon of some sort that is used. doesn't matter. It's your fist or a knife or your teeth, whatever it is. There has to be the act of killing. And the living being has to be dead. This is how it's understood when you say killing a living being. Likewise, to that extent, what it means when you say harming a living being. Now, what happens when you indulge in this kind of activity? Even if it's as small as killing a fly, swatting a fly or a mosquito. Well, when you do this, there is an intention to harm. So first and foremost, whenever you indulge in killing or harming, there is the strengthening of the intention of ill will, which means that in your meditation practice, when you sit down, and if you've been somebody who has continued to harm and kill living beings one way or the other, that sense of ill will, that hindrance of ill will will be predominant in your mind. And it will be difficult perhaps extremely difficult to deal with that hindrance. It will keep coming over and over and over again. And so indulging in this gives rise to that. But as you start to understand the principle behind this precept, this abstaining from harming and killing living beings, you will see the benefits of that, namely the reduction of ill will in your mind and the eventual eradication of that. But the um, the decrease of ill will as a hindrance in your mind is one benefit. But secondly, as you start to do this, as you start to abstain from this, you will notice that you have a certain kind of aura about you. There are beings that become naturally attracted to you. That is to say, they are comfortable in your presence. They feel at peace in your presence, there, whether it's other people or babies or animals or whatever, when they're around you, they seem to be naturally okay being around you. And eventually this becomes another kind of siddhi where when you're with that person or when you're in a group of people where there is a stressful situation, where there is, you know, anxiety and shouting and arguing back and forth, if you can just go into that room and send loving kindness, when you are able to refrain from that kind of harming and living, uh, harming and killing living beings, just your mere presence starts to calm the people in the room, right? So you'll notice that people are starting to argue. He said that, she said this. What do you think? They come to you and they say, what do you think? And you don't have to say anything. You just sit there and you radiate loving kindness. Within moments, you will notice that people start to become more um, collected. They start to forget about what it is that they were fighting. right? And then they start to realize, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And then they, you know, they make up and then they apologize and so on and so forth. This can happen. You will see it for yourself when you start to practice the perfection of this precept. Then we talked about then we talk about abstinence from taking what is not given. This is generally uh, understood as, you know, practically speaking, abstaining from stealing, taking what is not given. So unless explicitly somebody says, "Hey, you can have that," you abstain from taking that. And I like to be a little bit broader with this. Uh, particular precept, which is to say, when we say taking what is not given, it's not just physical items. It's not just possessions. It's not just objects, but it can be also taking what is not given in terms of attention. You know, you're sitting in a room of, uh, with people and they're talking and maybe you become jealous or maybe you are insecure of what another person is talking about in terms of their achievements and accomplishments. So you try to get into the conversation and you start to steer the conversation. You make it all about yourself 
right? You're taking the limelight away from somebody. Or you're trying to take credit for something that uh, maybe somebody else did. That's also taking what is not given, right? So what is the onset of this? Why would somebody do this? How does it arise? It's because of insecurity. And it's because, essentially, of a restless mind. So whenever somebody tries to take something what is not given, whether it's objects, whether it's credit, whether it's attention, whether it's whatever it is, it stems from a restless mindset. So the more you indulge in taking what is not given, the more restless your mind becomes. And therefore, you start to strengthen that hindrance of restlessness in your meditation practice. But there are benefits to keeping this precept aside from letting go of the hindrance of restlessness. When you become more aware of the things that are around you and you become more attentive to people's needs and then you actually ask, is this something I can take, right? There is a prevention of misunderstandings that could potentially arise. And whatever it is that you seem to be insecure about, right? That insecurity, first of all, starts to fade away. And in fact, the things that you seem to want start to come to you, right? Maybe you become insecure about, oh, that person has this particular possession or that person seems to have this much um you know, uh, in their bank account or whatever it is, you know, you become insecure about it. You become jealous of that. But when you let go of that jealousy through the utilization of Mudita, for example, then the things that you seek come to you. The fact of the matter is, as you start to let go of your obsession of the things that you're seeking out and trying to take from others what is not given, it will be given onto you. It will be given to you automatically. You will see this for yourself. And so what this means is that the mind becomes more content. And that is the greatest wealth in this universe, a content mind. It doesn't, ma doesn't matter who you are in this world. You might be you know, on the Forbes list and you might be the top billionaire in this or that. And on paper, you might be the wealthiest. But if your mindset is such that give me more, give me more, give me more, and I want to, you know, take, 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 then you'll never be satisfied. You will never be content. But you can be in the direst of situations, financially speaking. You could be in a situation where, you know, you're not making ends meet, but you start to become more content. And instead of taking what is not given, you start to practice generosity, right? It can start with the smile. It can start with giving words of support. It can then start with giving a portion of your income. You know, people often think, okay, if I give um, to this charity or if I give to, uh, you know, this organization and so on, then I'm motivated by the fact that my, by my generosity, more will given be given to me. Completely fine. But you know, when we talk about giving money, that is the least kind of generosity. That's one level of generosity. The One of the greatest things you can give is your time. That is the thing that you will not get back. Money will come and go, but time. So when you steal other people's time, that is also taking what is not given. But when you give them your time, when you give them your support, when you give them your presence and you give them a lending year, that is an amazing kind of generosity. And the highest generosity is teaching the Dhamma, offering the Dhamma to others, right? So when you start to perfect this practice, that happens automatically. Oftentimes people will say, hey, I want to start teaching. In my mind, I would say that if you want to start teaching, you're not ready to teach. Because you have to see what you're motivated by. Sure, maybe you're motivated by compassion. Maybe you're motivated by the idea that, hey, I have this information. I have 
attain this new wisdom, and I want to share it with the world. But in doing so, you are actually starting to identify with that role as a teacher. When you start to perfect your own practice, you don't care about whether you want to teach or not. What you will see, what you will find for yourself is that you start to get into situations where you have to teach, where people naturally ask you questions about this, that, or the other in relation to the Dhamma. And because of the perfection or the perfecting of the experience that you have, the experiential wisdom you have, whatever you say will be exactly what they need in terms of the teaching. So when we talk about abstaining from taking what is not given, it results in a mind that is content. All of this are steps towards samadhi, which we'll talk about later. But samadhi means that the mind is collected. It doesn't mean that the mind is super focused. It doesn't mean that the mind is laser pinpointed at an object. It means it's collected. And what that means is that it's collected because it has naturally let go. So when we get to Sama Samadhi, I will talk a little bit more about what this means. But suffice it to say that Sama Samadhi is the natural effect of having let go and the utilization of sati. That is to say, remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one object to the other, right? And remaining impersonal through that whole process. That can only happen when you're able to let go. That can only happen when the mind naturally becomes collected. And that can only happen when you are free of hindrances. And how do you become free of hindrances? You start to perfect the precepts. In other words, you start to perfect your bedrock, your foundation, that is the sila. Now, he talks about abstinence from misconduct in sensual pleasures, or in other words, sensual misconduct and also sexual misconduct. So what is sensual misconduct? Sensual misconduct means that the mind is craving for something in terms of the five physical sense bases. What are the five physical sense bases? The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body. The mind is the sixth, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about the cords of sensual pleasure, as the Buddha would put it. So when we try to overindulge in this, when we try to grasp onto this and in the pursuit of something that is an object of our sensual craving, what happens is we become obsessed by it. We become addicted to it. And being addicted to it, we will not see what is right and wrong. There is an imbalance in the mind. And through this imbalance, the mind starts to indulge in the breaking of other precepts for owning, for the sake of grasping onto those sensual pleasures. This is what is known as misconduct and sensual pleasures. But then what is sexual misconduct? Now, this is very interesting because sexual misconduct, generally speaking, when the Buddha talks about, about it, is not to indulge in any kind of sexual activity with one who is under the protection of one's parents or under or betrothed to another. So that means that you do not indulge, obviously, in the things like rape, in things like pedophilia, and so on and so forth. But let's talk about this, this idea of not engaging in sexual activity with somebody who is betrothed or who has who who is engaged what this means is you are loyal to your partner now it doesn't mean uh it doesn't matter i should say it doesn't matter whether it's a heterosexual or homosexual or whether it's a polyamorous or it's a polycule or whatever you want to talk about whatever it is but all that means is within the confines of that relationship, there is a level of loyalty where 
none of the partners cheat on the other. This is the understanding of, uh, you know, refraining from sexual misconduct. But there is a deeper level to understand about this, which I don't think has been talked about that often. But I will explain it from uh, the understanding in ancient India when we talk about energetics. This is to say that when you indulge in any kind of sexual activity that results in, you know, the cheating of one partner with another or cheating out of outside of the relationship and so on. And when you indulge in any kind of sexual activity that is um, not within the confines of a relationship, of an em emotionally secure relationship, what I'm referring to is basically things like one night stands or, uh, you know, uh, casual flings and things like that. Because the understanding is when you do that, you are engaging with the karma of the other person. So when you indulge in any kind of sexual activity like this, this is what happens. There is an exchange of karmic energy that's happening between the two of you. So between the two partners. But if that partner has indulged in constantly having different kinds of sexual encounters, then not only are you dealing with the energy of that particular partner, but potentially the energy of all of the other partners that that person has been with, which means that not necessarily that you take on their karma, but what happens is you start to become more like them one way or the other, because there is some kind of give and take. Even in a loving and emotionally secure relationship, there is a give and take, but that give and take is of a different quality. It's, it's something else that's long lasting, something else that is emotionally satisfying. Having these kinds of sexual encounters actually results in where the mind starts to lose touch with its own internal joy. You will see this for yourself, or you will see this in those who might engage in this kind of activity. Maybe, you know, at some point or another, we might have all engaged in something like this. And if you look back on it, you will see that it was not emotionally satisfying. In fact, you might have had some kind of regret. And that also results in further hindrances. So I'm not saying this as some kind of a you know, moral judge or anything like that. I'm just saying for the benefit of your practice, understand how you deal with your energy and who you choose to give your energy to, mentally, physically, verbally, emotionally, who you choose to give it to. Because the more you indulge in these kinds of frivolous acts, the more you're going to be uh, essentially out of joy. You will, you will see this in people when they indulge in these kinds of things. They forget how to laugh from their heart. It's difficult for them to find some kind of emotionally satisfying joy. So this is something else to take into account when we talk about abstinence or refraining from misconduct in sensual pleasures, but also sexual misconduct. And then the Buddha says, and what bhikkhus is right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path, the desisting from the three kinds of bodily misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right action that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. So in other words, when you start to take uh, the precepts, you have already intentionally decided that I will refrain from you know, breaking any of these precepts. Well, we've talked about the first four precepts, which are, you know, refraining from harming or killing living beings. We've talked about refraining from taking what is not given. We've talked about refraining from sensual and sexual misconduct. And we've talked about refraining from false speech.
But there is a fifth precept there, which is not mentioned here. But that fifth precept is refraining from indulgence in intoxicants. What is an intoxicant? In the time of the Buddha, it was known as Sura. And this is the where the word Asura comes from. You talk about the Devas and the Asuras. And the Asuras are those who fell from heaven or from, um, you know, where Saka is right now in the cosmology. They fell from it because they got too drunk. They got drunk. So the indulgence in any kind of intoxicant that clouds the mind is what the Buddha is referring to whenever he talks about this. Now, this is very interesting because this particular precept came about a little later. And the precedent for that, as I understand it, is that it was where you could drink toddy. Toddy is a fermented uh, drink made from coconut water. And you could drink that, and that's fine. But it has some alcohol in it. And it it's just so happened that there was an arahat who drank copious amounts, I believe, of that toddy. And was not himself, let's say. Was uh, perhaps a little too jovial, perhaps in a stupor, perhaps a little too drunk. And this did not look good for the sangha. So when you look back into the Vinaya, you will see that oftentimes all of these are precedents to create a certain kind of image of the Sangha. Because the Sangha is the direct representative or representation of the Dhamma and Buddha. So in order to maintain that nobility of the Sangha, the Buddha put into account this particular precept. Yes, there is a, a sutta, maybe a couple of suttas, depends on which, uh, which Nikaya you go into. But there is a sutta where the Buddha declares somebody becoming a stream enter uh, who was known to be a drunkard. And one of the uh, monks that was Mahanama was walking around and he heard uh, the villagers saying, oh, how easy it is nowadays to become a Sotapanna. The Buddha seems to be declaring everybody a Sotapanna, anyone and everyone, even this particular person who had alcohol on his breath, on his dying breath. And so Mahanama goes to the Buddha and he says, how could you declare this person who was known to indulge in alcohol as a stream enter, as a Sotapanna. And the Buddha said, it is because Mahanama, in that moment prior to his dissolution of the body, he had full experiential confidence in the triple gem, in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And because of that, it elevated his mind away from that and he was therefore declared a Sotapanna. Now, that does not excuse any of us to say that, oh, well, I should just do that. I can still continue to indulge in this intoxicant or that intoxicant and so on. But all I have to do is, when I die, just remember the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Not so easy. It doesn't work that way all the time. This particular person was practicing still. Even if you're practicing and you still indulge in this, there is always the risk that your mind becomes dull. And this is what my point is. Whenever there is an overindulgence in anything, and I've mentioned this in past retreats, whether it's binging on the latest Netflix show, whether it's you know um, indulging in watching the news too often, whether it's, you know, uh, going on YouTube and just continuously looking at this video and that video or going on the internet and just surfing mindlessly on what's going on, you will notice at the end of that, your mind starts to feel slightly dull. It just dulls out. And so this is closely related to the hindrance of sloth and torpor. 
when there is an overindulgence in anything, it has a tendency to create this dullness. And this dullness is translated as the hindrance of sloth and torpor when you are in meditation. But what you will see is once you start to let go of this overindulgence, and once you start to let go of breaking this fifth precept, your mind becomes sharper and clearer. There was a question asked of me recently in India, where I had gone to someone's house upon their invitation for lunch and then giving a talk. And they said, <clears throat> you know, we talk to other people about the precepts and so on and so forth, but they always have this uh, issue with, you know, what about just a glass of wine or beer at the end of the day, you know, is that so bad? And all I said is, you know, we are, we can say what we have to, we can say, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, but we are not a moral police. We don't have to police people around. People are uh, free to do as they please. But what I'll say is, and I've explained to them, is that as you start to get into this uh, path, you will notice that your mind, the quality of your mind becomes subtler and subtler. And as it becomes subtler and subtler, your mind starts to see the movements that get affected by the overindulgence in, in these intoxicants. And eventually, it starts to get in the way of your um, desire to be clear-minded. Because as you become more clear-minded, as you become more collected, as your mindfulness becomes sharper, you want to make sure you yourself will have this wholesome desire to make sure that nothing gets in the way of it. And so through your experience and experimentation, you realize overindulging in this intoxicant or overindulging in doing this particular activity starts to dull out my mindfulness. And so because you want to keep that mindfulness, eventually your mind will start to let go of breaking that precept automatically. Again, that's not an excuse for any of us to say, hey, you know, it'll happen when it happens. Start to make the effort of keeping that piece up as best as you can. The other thing is because of this clarity of mind, when you keep this, well, before I continue with that, I want to also explain the benefit of keeping that precept of you know, not indulging in sensual pleasures, not uh, having misconduct due to sensual pleasures. It reduces the ill, uh, the hindrance, I should say, of sensual craving. And your mind becomes much clearer. It's easier for you to get into jhana when you do this. It's easier for your mind to start to notice and experience truly the immaterial joy. That is to say, the joy that is not dependent on the five physical sense basis. You experience another otherworldly kind of joy, a transcendental, super mundane joy and bliss that when you do experience over time, it starts to dull out the other sensual pleasures. And as you continue to do this, you eradicate your obsession with the pursuit of sensual pleasures. In other words, that sensual desire starts to dull out, starts to burn out, and eventually your mind remains ever joyful, ever blissful, ever aware. Tied also to this fifth precept, where you have greater degrees of clarity. Now, as you do this, what you will find is because your mind is able to get into jhana easier, your mind is able to become more quiet easier, which means that you're able to actually listen to your intuition more. In fact, the voice of your intuition, so to speak, starts to get louder as you start to maintain this level of sila. Now, finally, we'll get into what is right livelihood. So here the Buddha says, and what bhikkhus is right 
livelihood. What is right livelihood that is affected by taints partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions? Here, Bhikkhus, a noble disciple, abandons wrong livelihood and gains his living by right livelihood. This is right livelihood that is affected by taints partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. Well, that doesn't say much, but what it's talking about is essentially the right livelihood of uh, a noble one or somebody who is starting to be on the path. There are other suttas in which the Buddha talks about a list of what is right livelihood and what is wrong livelihood. In the case of lay people, it is not engaging in any kind of business activities that cause any kind of harm. So that means in not engaging in any kind of trade that deals in the manufacturing of weapons, that deals in slaves and human trafficking, that deals in poisons, that deals in intoxicants, and that deals in the slaughter of beings for meat. In the case of the monastics, there's a whole host of things that are considered as wrong livelihood. And oftentimes people will confuse that because in that list, it talks about, you know, palmistry, it talks about astrology, it talks about, you know, reading the sky, reading this and that, uh, discerning through different kinds of uh, signs, perhaps like with tarot and things like that. It talks about uh, not being a doctor, and so on. But this is all for the sake of the, the bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis. In other words, these are instructions given to those who are who have gone into brahmacharya, the holy life. For those who are essentially on the path as a bhikkhu and bhikkhuni, for one goal and one goal only. And that is the total eradication of suffering. That is the experience of Nibbana. So all of these other things get in the way. Doesn't mean that a lay person can't be a doctor. Doesn't mean a lay person can't be an astrologer. Doesn't mean a lay person can't be a palm reader, this or that or the other. It just means that these can be distractions for those who are a little bit more serious because they have taken on the robes. So anything that gets in the way of getting to your final goal can be considered wrong livelihood in that sense. And of course, you know, in terms of the Sangha, the Bhikkhu Sangha and the Bhikkhuni Sangha, uh, it can be seen really, it can be seen as something strange where, you know, a Bhikkhu is trying to read somebody's palm or, you know, indulging in this astrology or that astrology for the sake of, money or whatever it is. Uh, there is another kind of wrong livelihood in another sutta where the Buddha says, you know, he tries to attain this with what he already has. So that means that whatever he has, he tries to trade in for something else, you know, engaging in the exchange of this or that for favors or whatever it might be. These are all uh, extraneous because these are all related to the holy life as a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni. But for the noble, uh, for the one who is a layperson, it is essentially not indulging in any kind of activity or any kind of business that causes harm to other beings. So you have to see for yourself. Oftentimes there'll be questions asked where, what if I am investing in, you know, the stock market and I find that this particular stock is related to this particular company that, you know, engages in human trafficking somehow or in, in, engages in child labor or engages in this, that, or the other. Yeah, that's very difficult. The thing about it is this is samsara. When you are in samsara, you are enmeshed in all kinds of different, difficult and challenging situations, morally speaking. All you can do is use your intuition. And if it really feels like you should not be investing in this company, don't invest in it. It all depends upon 
your particular situation. You know, somebody will ask the question about, you know, okay, it says not to engage in trade that deals in the slaughter of meat, a slaughter of animals for the sake of meat. Then why is it that you eat meat? Or not me specifically, but anybody within the community or the bhikkhus even, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, why do they eat meat in that case? Well, there is a sutta called Jivaka Sutta, where the Buddha gives certain kinds of criteria where he says, under these circumstances, bhikkhus are not to take any kind of meat when they suspect that an animal has been killed for them. Right? When they uh, hear or see the animal being slaughtered for them, or when they know in that case that the animal has been slaughtered for their sake, they cannot take that. So oftentimes then it's said that, okay, but what about us lay people, because we always buy meat at the supermarket, or we, you know, order our meat from this butcher shop, or this or that. Well, technically speaking, we have to see that that animal specifically wasn't killed for us. Now, yes, people can say, oh, that's a loophole, and so on and so forth. Completely fine. My point is, you know, if you want to be vegan, and you want to be vegetarian, more power to you. But so long as somebody is not actually hunting, especially for sport, but hunting for their animal, uh, for their meat, or not, um, you know, indulging in the slaughter of that animal for the sake of that meat, then it's okay. So let people live as they want to live. Who are we to try to change them? This is what we have to understand in this community, okay, which is, we have to stop trying to be on this high ground where, oh, what about them? What about these people? What about them? We are better than them. I'm holier than thou. No. All of that is rooted in conceit. It's rooted in identity. It's rooted in ego. Take care of your own self and everything else will be taken care of. Yeah. So if you believe by not indulging in meat, you are somehow helping the planet. And by all means, do that. But don't try to reel other people in. All you're doing is you're becoming an evangelist. Right? Don't do that for the Dhamma either. Don't try to say, hey, you should try this out. You should check this out. So with this sort of view that I'm better than you, because that's where it stems from. It stems from that conceit that I know better. I have the higher wisdom. So let me tell you what you should be doing. If you let go of that, you will find more peace of mind for yourself. And when you have more peace of mind for yourself, it's easier for you to meditate. Very straightforward, I'm saying that you are responsible for your own awakening. You are responsible for your own welfare. It matters, importantly, that you attain full awakening first and foremost. Because when you do that, things will change around you. Where you are actually able to help others. I'm not saying that you don't help others right now. I'm not saying that you don't have compassion. But what I am saying is that you have to have a balance. We are not here to be saviors of the world. We are not here to be messiahs. Okay, we are here because at some point or another, we screwed up. And now we have to find a way to get out of this matrix. And the way to do that is to focus on our own practice is to focus on our own development of mind in terms of the precepts. That is to say, sila, samadhi, which f comes into fruition through panya, through wisdom. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll take some questions now. Thank you, Delson. And... Uh... If there's any questions, I suppose raising your hand would be... David, good. are you in two places at the same time? I, I am. 
I am. I am. <laughs> now, my computer was getting a little dicey. It, it was freezing, so I just hopped up here. So I'm keeping an eye on both places. Everything's all right. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great talk, Delcy. Um, all right. Who's 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 got a question? All right. We got raised hands here. Is that Mario or you? No. Patrick was first, I guess. All right. Patrick. Thanks, David. And thank you, Delson. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so right livelihood in regards to right livelihood, um, it seems like it was much more straightforward in the time of the Buddha in terms of proper <laughs> livelihood. So I've been a software engineer for many years. We make software for manufacturers. And I've known for many years that some of the manufacturers make pesticide. Some are in the food industry. And I've been okay with that. But recently, within the last month, maybe two months, um, the company has formed a group to go after defense contractors. Mm. And that bothers me a lot. But my, uh, so when I'm writing software and the company's intention seems to be to provide software for manufacturers, how they use it, it seems to me would be like their comma. But is that true? Or am I just trying to justify it in my head? So the way I would look at it is like, if somebody decides to, you know, okay, I know this is a very rudimentary example, but hopefully it helps you. You know, if somebody decides to be, you know, in the business of making, different kinds of tools, hardware tools. And someone else buys that, right? And takes that tool and uses it as a weapon. Is that person who has manufactured that particular tool, which was not intended to be used as a weapon, karmically responsible for that particular incident? No. So you have to see for yourself, if it's really creating some kind of agitation in your mind, maybe you need to rethink the choices you're making in terms of the business you want to get into. But my point about this is uh, we cannot help how we deal and engage in this world. Yeah. So yeah, the software, whatever you are um, developing is for this particular use, but you can't control how that software is going to be used and for what purposes. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you, Delson. Hey, Mario, didn't you have a question here? <clears throat> yeah, ju just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, Delson, what you said about right speech reminded me of uh, a talk I heard by Tanisa Robiku the other day. And he says, okay, we're going to talk about right speech but only one condition. We cannot talk about Nazi Germany. <laughs> that is the one thing we cannot do, right? And it, 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 it reminds me of that because I imagine, of course, that comes up every time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my point. I mean, these hypotheticals are not going to get you anywhere. Unless you find yourself in that situation, then you'll know what to do. But there's no point in engaging with these kinds of hypotheticals. Okay, David, next person. Question. David? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, David. And uh, thank you, Delson. Um, just a quick question about uh, the unconscious. I know uh, in your first talk, I think you talked about CBT and uh, <laughs> rational motive therapy and also IFF. Uh, I'm psychoanalytically trained and um just curious what you think about right action but um when wrong action is perhaps unconsciously motivated uh so for instance i guess it begs the question that we actually know our mind better than uh we think we do um, so just curious um what you might say about certain unconscious motivations um 
and how best to deal with that and maybe even go further. I mean, uh, does the uh, Arahant uh, have no unconscious that would perhaps lead them into uh, these sorts of uh, wrong actions, wrong speeches, wrong so on and so forth? Um, so can I get some clarity on what you mean by unconscious motivations? Sure. So again, the assumption is, is and maybe this is just uh, uh, that the Arahant is totally uh, consciously aware uh, of the purposes and motivations behind their actions, uh, which may be the case. I mean, uh, I'm not ruling that out, but I'm just... Uh, as a psychoanalyst, I assume that there's an unconscious. Whether one, and maybe this is the, the purpose of a, a mindfulness practice, is to be so, I'll just use the word well analyzed, because that's the language of psychoanalysis, that you're so well analyzed and mindful that you would never find yourself in a, a situation in which you would um, unconsciously act in a way that creates, again, this wrong, wrong action, so to speak. And, so let's say it's harmful, it's hurtful. Again, I understand philosophically that in principle to say, well, the Arahant would never find themselves in this situation because they're so, again, well-analyzed, mindful, you know, um, uh, openly aware that, and that's, again, fine to say, uh, but, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to pull out historical examples of, uh, you know, gurus and whatnot, Trump go in who's behaved poorly, crazy with so on and so forth. I know that that will lead us down a, a wrong path. I'm just asking you in terms of how you would deal with the question of an unconscious. Uh, if, I mean, unless you th feel that again, the Arahant is so well analyzed that there just simply is no unconscious, that they're fully conscious, always fully aware of what they do, how they do it, when they do it. So, they're never, there's not a blind spot. They're never sort of caught off guard. So you have to understand when we talk about uh, karma, that this is why the Buddha has always said karma is intention. Intention is karma. In other words, there is a conscious decision to lie. There's a conscious decision to harm. There's a conscious decision to steal, there's a conscious decision to engage in some kind of misconduct. So there's always going to be intention involved in these kinds of wrongful activities to be considered unwholesome karma. There was uh, another example of where, you know, the Buddha was walking around and he saw this monk just frozen standing just on this piece of ground, not moving. And the Buddha said, what are you doing? He said, well, I know that there are beings that are uh, underneath this ground. And if I walk, you know, I might harm them. They might, they might be killed because of my stepping onto that ground. And the Buddha said, you, you can't control that. I'm paraphrasing. But basically, you can't control that. In essence, you know, if you did something unconsciously, if you did something by mistake, if you did something that was not intended, then that's not karma. This is the philosophical, since we're getting to philosophy, this is the philosophical understanding within the context of Buddhism. The other understanding is the Jain philosophy. Whether I intended it or not intended it, I am beholden to the effects of that. This is the difference. For the Arahat, being fully conscious, they will not find themselves in these situations. Okay, Anne, got a question. So I guess the Arahat won't have mice <laughs> in their house. <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, we have a little mouse, at least one that we see, and my husband wants to go after it and I won't let him. <laughs> but, but of course, you know, they, they do propagate and 
So we've got these um, herbal things all over the kitchen and, and, and we are cleaning up the kitchen way more impeccably than ever. So I'm hoping that he feels unwelcome. However, I'm sure this is a, uh, not a unique situation. And I, and I can never remember because I've asked David about ticks, you know, Damasuka's out in the country and you don't want to kill anything and you ticks. But so please advise. Since you use the example of an arhat, you know what an arhat would do? Yes, I'd like to know. <laughs> they just move house. <laughs> move out of the house and give it to the yeah, mice? They just move to a different place, right? Because they don't have any ownership of anything anyway. <laughs> But, you know, the mice will be somewhere where it's warm <laughs> and there's food, just like us. Maybe they'll become friends with the mice, you know. Uh -huh. Maybe they'll use the mice to their advantage. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just I'm just joking around. But can yeah, I, go let ahead, me, David. Let me interject. I mean, we have a lot of mice here. We have this problem. And uh, we use uh, little, they're uh, what, what, live traps. Little things you can buy on Amazon for like have bucks. a heart, have a heart traps. Yeah, what whatever, and you they go in, they get a little peanut butter, and they trap, and then you you drive them down to the lake, and and they have a lake cottage down there, and you say, hey, here's your place, and this you just keep doing this, and then bugs and wasps come into your cabin and your place, so you get your critter catcher from Amazon, mm -hmm. and you grab those and you take them out, and you take them out, and you take them out. And pretty soon there's nothing there. And then the next day you just do that again. Now people say, well, there's some there's uh, some pigs rooting around. This is dangerous. We better call somebody. And it says, well, fine, just let the pigs root around. Until they come up here, what's the problem? So it's been our experience. We have a lot of critters running around. We live with them. It's I do. I like to have a heart. I, I'll Because I'll, we do have a heart traps for critters who get in our garden. You know, the... We have probably populated this area, a certain area with groundhogs. Of okay. course, that's supposed against the law. You're not supposed to do that. But the, if we called the the people, they'd kill them. So, yeah. But but my I hadn't thought about it for the mice. Thank you. Okay. This reminds me actually, David. I mean, this might get into a whole other tangent, but I wonder if it's useful. Didn't you have a situation in your cabin where, or underneath your cabin, or near your cabin? Where there was a war with squirrels or something like that? Yeah, there were there was probably mice or rodents down there scratching away. And yeah. I would go out, make a lot of noise, and, and then shut up. And then it was kind of a constant thing. What what would you Yeah, my 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 thing was you didn't really do anything to them. You just allowed them to be there. Yeah. 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 And they disappeared because and everything just is permanent. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> And, and this year, nothing. So. But I, I do understand your question, Anne, because, you know, there are situations in um, people who have houses and homes and apartments where, you know, they have cockroaches and spiders and other kinds of insects and things like that. And to that, I would just say is, you know, live with them. Just well, live with them. well, um, at one time we had a, a compost area that was open and it seemed to work wonderful. We went away for 21 days, and when we came back, there were rats climbing the peach trees and just roiling around, and so many of them. They, it turned out there was a whole tunnel. It was like a, a rat resort underneath the compost, and there, was, they, there were like many. Well, Larry did go after them, and now I feel like an accomplice because I didn't stop him, but... but um, and then it was a concern not only for our house, but for the houses next door. And we kind of have a close neighborhood. So it was a real, that was a real dilemma. This one little mouse doesn't, but I, I only see the one. <laughs> but there usually isn't just one. They're very social. So I'm hoping they, it's warm now. So they'll probably, maybe they'll feel more comfortable outside. Yeah, one one other thing. What the, the ultimate example is termites, and people don't know what to do with them. And I've told people, you know, live with them until the house falls down, and then move, I mean, or just move. You don't have to put the tent on, kill everything, because there might be some weakness, and so you know, 
piece of timber is not looking so hot. It's it's okay. Just let them have their way, and then, of course, you know, might not be able to sell that house. But I again, don't think you, you don't get in these situations. You just don't get in these situations. But and what also, about the microbes? Yeah, if we're going to get picky, uh, microbes. Oh. You know, get you get a pneumonia and your lungs are infected with organisms. You know, you don't want to die of pneumonia. This is a, when yeah, you know, this is a good. It. These are good distinction because uh, it's interesting within the cosmology, and this is where it becomes uh, slightly philosophical and things like that. Because within the cosmology, there is no taking into account bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, and to some extent the plant kingdom as being uh, beings. However, in the Jain uh, context, in the Jain cosmology, all of these are taken into account. And you will see a lot of times with the Jains, they have very extreme ways of dealing with it. They'll cover their mouths with a certain kind of mask so that their breath doesn't uh, destroy the microbes in the air and so on and so forth. So uh, what I'm saying is within the, uh, the Buddhist cosmology, since they're not taking into account as beings, um, <laughs> And what defines a being is that being has some kind of karma that they have to deal with and that they can evolve through the cosmology one way or the other. Secondly, a being is also identified or understood as someone or a mind, let's say, that identifies with one or more of the five aggregates. So we just don't really know when it comes to microbes, especially viruses, because we, you know, there's a, there's a whole debate on that, whether viruses are actually alive or not. Um, you know, and then when it comes to bacteria, yeah, we can consider them as alive um, and they do divide and they do grow, but they don't necessarily evolve beyond that into, or they have the potential to evolve into something greater in the animal kingdom, if we're taking into account the cosmology. So, also, uh, when you talk about disease, you know, the Buddha was sick. Uh, the Buddha had colds. The Buddha had uh, whatever infection. But Jivaka, who I mentioned before in the Jivaka Sutta, who was his personal doctor, and he would give him medicines and medications and uh, different kinds of treatments that would have to invariably uh, deal with these microbes one way or the other. So... You know, I hope that answers it. Okay, I think we're going to get out the question on the issue of bugs and things like that. Quilly, how about you? Well, I think this discussion is kind of interesting because I'll just comment on the have a heart trap. The have a heart trap is really about this heart because many of the beings that you that you trap and then relocate, they die because they are not relocatable. You can't just say, okay, Mr. Rattlesnake, you go live over here. So you've, you know, and I think the precepts are an attempt in a way to, to create a way of being. But I really, what I took from today's talk was that Develop your own practice and then you don't have to worry about these things so much, you know, to try to get there before. And I, I always have the question about our, our planet herself and like, what's a living being? Like, that was an interesting definition you just said, but we are abusing our minerals. We, you know, I might be wearing a beautiful crystal around my neck or something because, and what? It, and certainly the oil system, I mean, is obvious. So I just see how important the moment is because you got to decide right in this moment what the right thing to do is. And um, I, I noticed that shame coming up because uh, as an older person, I really don't have a whole lot of energy at, 
at the end of the day, and it's getting earlier <laughs> that end of the day. And I, it's, I do turn to Netflix, you know, and I, tr you know, I try to choose wisely, and it, but that is not really possible. And I really have to agree. What really came up today was about how that leads to me wanting to watch Netflix tomorrow, <laughs> you know? So it's, and I'm noticing the brain or the mind, and I, I can't differentiate really, um, but that it's really um, changing. And so I can't use the same techniques that I once used. And, and so what do I do? How do I adapt in this moment? It's a, it's a genuine question. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you brought up, you know, minerals and things like that. And yeah, I mean, in some sense, everything that we see around us uh, has some level of beingness, not necessarily, you know, I mean, again, the definition of what is life and what is living is so, it's going to be around for as long as samsara is around, let's say, you know, and, and so trying to define that is like one of those undefinables when it comes to karma and things like that. But to your point, you know, for example, we all use, you know, mobile phones, we all use smartphones, and they have lithium batteries in them. And they, you know, have different kinds of precious minerals and rare earth minerals, uh, metals and things like that. And uh, as far as uh, the news is concerned, they say that uh, some of these are mined using child labor, it's using slave labor, it's, you know, and it's a tragedy. But this is the world we live in. This is how life is our life this is the whole point of life is suffering the fact that we are engaging in this world uh is going to cause suffering one way or the other but it's not intentional it's not our intention to cause this suffering again very careful with the statement that doesn't mean that we have to stop living you know physically or otherwise but we have to be more mindful we have to be more aware and that can vary in terms of the degree. Some people want to be more ecologically aware. Some people want to be more environmentally friendly. Some people want to be more whatever it is. You decide to make the choices that you want to make. There is no one universal answer here for these kinds of situations. Whatever seems to cause the mind mental peace, which can then allow you to evolve in your own practice, is really... Um, is really the pathway here. Yeah, that's important. And when does intention come? You know, now I know lithium batteries are in my phone. So there's a little bit of agreement, let's call it. I don't know. So then what's I done is done. What's done is done. That's the idea. That's what's done is done. And now you make a different choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in, in, before that, you didn't have an intention to do yeah. this or that. Yeah. We are in samsara, right? We can't. That's we. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, Delson. Thank you for these talks. They're really rich. Okay, who's uh, Mario's back? All right, Mario, go for it. Hello. One question about the, the language used in the sutta, because um, for every aspect, we have a mundane and, and right and a transcendental, maybe not a good word. But, but in the second, it says that it's taintless, that it's developing the path. So clearly, what is it meant by taintless in that sense? Because it's, it's developing the path. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. having trouble understanding what taintless means. Yeah. So it's referring to different situations. So it says that path that's, that is noble, that path that is a factor of the path, or sorry, that aspect that is a factor of the path, that which is taintless, uh, doesn't ripen acquisitions, and, uh, you know, all of these other statements that are mentioned for the super mundane, for the transcendental, it's just referring to different situations. Not that it's always pointing to the same thing. So 
It's a factor of the path for one who is a noble one, one who has entered the stream and is practicing towards becoming taintless. And it's also uh, something practiced by one who is taintless, i.e. the arha, the fully awakened one. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Looks like everybody's got right view and uh, figured it out. And uh, Delson, any final words? Any final words? Um, see you guys next week. Okay. All right, next week, we'll, what's the subject uh, next week, Delson? Right mindfulness. Right mindfulness. All right, we'll be mindful of the date and the time. All right, let's share some merit then. Do you have it up on the screen or no? No. All right, let's see if I remember again. I put it in the chat, Delson. Oh, it's oh you did. Oh. Okay, for those who want to follow along. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. All right. Hi, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank Del you, Delson. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kristen. Everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.